key to mental health. America seems to be going crazy, going mad. Our mental health institutions are swamped. The clinics and psychological, psychological hospitals, psychotic hospitals can't cope with the patient load. And the state and federal agencies are saying to us now that the mental problem, the mental health problem in New York State especially is unmanageable. In fact, actually it's out of control. Absolutely out of control. People who break down are taken to the hospital and now rather than being institutionalized, they're called what, what they call now stabilizing. In other words, they take them there and for two, three weeks, they'll fill them with drugs, tranquilize them, send them home or back out on the streets. Where is there a single New Yorker who hasn't seen what's, what the result is outside on the street? Have you seen uh, all those who have been released from mental institutions now running like loose cannons on the street, ready to go off at any time? Many of them homeless, helpless. Many of them are going to die on the street this winter. Uh, you know it's down 41st Street here between 8th and 9th. All of those big cardboard boxes from the, from the New York Times uh, building, they take them over. There. Those are their homes. They're sleeping there. Many of the mental cases that need to be institutionalized, hospitalized because of sin and what sin has done in their lives. And now they're being dumped right on the streets because everything is out of control. The entire mental health situation in this nation is completely out of control. Never in history have so many people become depressed and mentally troubled. Millions of Americans are turning to cocaine and alcohol to ease that troubled mind. That's why this city has become a crack crazy city. People are wanting just a few hours of release from this depression from the blues, from the troubling of their own minds. America is one gigantic supermarket for drugs for the pushers of the whole world. They're coming in from Iran, they're coming in from Colombia, they're coming in from Mexico, coming in from all over the world. This is the biggest supermarket for drugs on the face of the earth. Do you know e even ministers now? Did you, did you read about the, or hear about the school superintendent right here? in uh, New York City, who was buying two vials of crack, and he's going to be put out. And now Hollywood celebrities, sports heroes, politicians, Wall Streeters, heads of corporation, ministers, school principals, educators, they're hanging out on street corners now. They're hanging around in dark corridors waiting for their pusher. I know right now of a man that I tried to help. He was president of a corporation, a multi-million dollar corporation. I watched that man in three months go down. I watched him come one day in a nice, nice suit, all dressed up, and three months later see him having slept on the street, filthy and dirty, and now he stands on the street looking for his pusher. Lost everything. He's no longer in his corporation. He's gone. Airline captains, train conductors, surgeons, they, they are, there are literally hundreds of doctors hooked on drugs now. Twelve hundred 1,200, listen to this now, 1,200 anesthesiologists are hooked on drugs now. 1,200 they've estimated. Now, these are the doctors who administer, uh, you know, when you go into to an operation, they administer the tranquilizers and anesthesia. And there's a, a new drug that they've been experimenting with, phenyl, that's 1,500 times more powerful than crack. 1,500 times. It's a designer drug. In fact, there was an article recently about some uh, uh, anesthesiologists out on a uh, golf course, and they were talking about sharing their party pack. They're called party packs. And you know, if, even if America gets ahead of their crack problem and we stop crack coming in, cocaine coming in, heroin coming in, it's just going to create a new problem just as bigger, bigger, because there are new designer drugs now. These designer drugs are created by uh, pharma, uh, pharmacologists and scientists who have been hooked themselves on their own formulas and they have left their institutions and taken their formulas with them and now in their garages. In fact, you can get in just, I, I saw an article the other day just in a shoe box this big, you can get almost a hundred million dollars in a shoe box of these new designer drugs. Some of these new designer drugs are 6,000 times more powerful than crack. 6,000. 
They say just one experiment with it. And if we get rid of all the crack, get rid of the heroin, they're going to bring in speed again and all the designer drugs, just as they're doing in London. Gary just came home from London. Uh, what do they call them now? Speed shops. Acid houses. And that's spreading around London. We'll have acid houses instead of crack houses. Because, you see, men's minds are, are so troubled, they're going to do anything to try to find a little bit of relief. They'll go for anything. See, we were told, weren't we, that success is the American dream. That would solve all our problems. Money would solve all problems. The good life, the good American life, everybody wanted a piece of the pie. Have you ever heard that? But someone forgot to tell them that that ladder at the top has another side, and it's a slide board. Sliding board goes right down into the pits of hell. What they're doing is they're climbing the sliding board to go right down the other side into the pits of despair. Why is it that the richest, most successful, most famous, most beautiful people in America are the most mixed up mentally and are going to drugs and alcohol? Now, there are four major drug treatment centers and hospitals now for the rich and famous. Betty Ford Hospital is just one of them. They're charging $40,000 for six weeks of treatment. $40,000. You've got to be rich to even get in. How many of you remember the Beatles? Anybody remember the Beatles? Now, listen, I, I remember the day that one of those Beatles on national television said, we're going to outlive Jesus Christ. That was his boast. His name was John Lennon. I can look out my window on 68th Street and I look at the Dakota, the Dakota apartment house. That's where John Lennon was murdered. And the last five years of his life, John and Oka were... were uh, imprisoned there, self-imprisonment. They were locked into that place, stoned on drugs for five years. When that young man shot John Lennon down outside the Dakota, John Lennon was skin and bone. He was a skeleton, a walking skeleton. John Lennon did not live, outlive Jesus Christ. But John Lennon never had a dear peace. He was trying to stone himself out of his mind. There was some haunting voice. There was something driving he spent the last five years in a drunken, drugged, crazy stupor. I don't know if you read the paper this week, but now another Beatle, Ringo Starr, has just, he was the Beatles' drummer, and his wife Barbara Bach, they've just checked into Arizona Rehab Clinic after eight years of booze and pills and cocaine. And yesterday the newspaper said this, it's been an eight-year nightmare for Ringo Starr, and Barbara Bach, of booze and drug abuse. The couple were so deteriorated when they went in the hospital, they looked like the walking dead. Ringo suffers drug-induced blackouts, and he beats up his wife and doesn't even remember it. He can't remember his own songs that he's written. He has a heart problem. Both have liver damage. They were trying to drink themselves into oblivion. Ringo checked into the Tucson clinic looking old and tired and burned out like someone who died but was afraid to lay down. That was just on Tuesday. Eight years in a drunken stupor trying to drown something out in the head. The depression wouldn't go away. And the more drugs they take, the more depressed they get. Liz Taylor's back in the hospital again. One of America's most glamorous, wealthiest stars. Back in the hospital trying to fight a demon of drugs. And one by one, they're dying off. One by one, they're going into eternity with their minds haunted. Voices that can't be stilled. Depressed. The most depressed people on the face of the earth. She's got diamonds as big as rocks. And they do her no good because there's a mind condition that can't be solved. Now, as a Christian, I'm not surprised at the mental, spiritual breakdown we're seeing all over America in the secular world. Jesus himself said that things are going to get so frightful that men's hearts would fail them for fear of watching those things that are coming on the earth. And men's hearts are failing them for fear right now. Daniel said, knowledge shall be increased. But then Ecclesiastes said, in much knowledge there's much grief. He, that increases his knowledge, increases his sorrow. And this knowledge is increased. It's the knowledge that we're going to be, we're going to be blown off the face of this earth one of these days with hydrogen bombs. It's the knowledge that AIDS is sweeping the country. It's the knowledge that this dream is going to burst. 
It's a knowledge that's bringing sorrow. You can go to Wall Street any day of the week. Go down there tomorrow if you choose. Go down there at 3, 30, 4 o'clock when, when the, the market closes. And you watch about 5,000 brokers coming out of Wall Street brokerage houses. And watch them go down two blocks, a whole area there. Uh, and watch them pour into the bars. The bars are absolutely crowded, all dressed in blue and gray suits. All look alike, like penguins. <laughs> now, it, listen to me. If, if, you're, if you're a broker, we've got a few brokers here. And, and you know I'm not... I'm not trying to be facetious, but I was down there recently, and I watched them. They all have little, all, I think they buy their briefcases at the same store, their suits at the same store. All brook suits with red ties. But the thing that bothers me most of all, they're like cattle. They all go to the same bars, and they, they have to go and get a cocktail or two to bring them down, coming down, because of the tension. There's something driving, and then after a cocktail, they go home and eat a quick supper, and they go back to the bar so they can get enough courage to go back to work tomorrow. Now, you can expect that because they don't have anybody to go to. They've got no one to talk to. Their psychiatrists don't ha- can't help them. Their marriages are boring to them. Almost every one of them I talk to, they're, they're sick and tired of their marriage. There's no happiness except in a bottle or a pill. A vial of crack and crack spreading all over Wall Street right now. But you see, that's to be expected because they have nowhere to go, they have no hope, they have no savior. Now look, where do people in the world go for relief? Where do they go for something to solve this, this crying in the mind? There is no hope for them outside of, uh, see, we have a place to go, but they have none whatsoever. So they drink, they do drugs, they're trying To find just a few hours of relief. But the world does not expect Christians, listen to me now, the world does not expect Christians to go through the same kind of despair that they're going through. When they see Christians in despair, they say, why should I serve your Jesus? Why should I go with you to church when you're just as depressed as I am? You're just as blue as I am. What good is your religion? What good is your church? if it doesn't bring you joy and peace of mind. You see, you, they say, you've got the same kind of fear. You're troubled just like me. What kind of a God do you serve? And I tell you, there are a lot of Christians that are very poor commercial for Jesus. I mean, they're very poor commercial whatsoever. They have no joy whatsoever. Now, I don't mean you run around with a silly, uh, silly Colgate grin on your face. I, I mean that you're, you're not complaining, you're not grieving like the rest. And when you see the world coming apart, you can still say, thank God I'm saved. But you see, the truth is a good and great, a great and growing number of Christians are not enjoying good mental health. Now, I'm not talking about them going insane. I don't, I, I've never met an insane Christian yet. I'm not talking about nervous breakdowns because we're not seeing a lot of nervous breakdowns. And and burnout's not the thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about this widespread blanket of dejection, the blues, and depression that seems to be sweeping over many, many churches and Christians today. Do you know there are are husbands that come to me in in the special last five years and they say, Brother Wilkinson, I, I love my wife, I love my family, but something's changing in my house. I don't know what's happening to my wife. And it, it, sometimes it's when they're in their 40s or early 50s and they say, she must be going through a change of life because my wife is so irritable. My wife can't sleep. My wife has a tiredness that comes over her that you can't describe. There are times that she's jealous and she doesn't want to be. She's fearful and she hates it. I hear so many say, Brother Deep, I really am trying, but I can't take it. I can't take it anymore. I hear that. I've heard it in this church. I get it by mail. There's something happening to my wife. I don't understand. She's going through some changes. It's not the wife I married. She's always, there's something coming over her. and She can't shake it. I know she loves me, but Brother Deep, I can't take it anymore. Because I come home from work and I'm tired and I'm weary and I walk in there. And I hate to walk in anymore. It's so, it's so dead in my house. There's, there's a spirit there that I can't handle anymore. And sometimes it's the husband. 
who's so deeply troubled in mind and he, he can't pull out of a melancholy spirit that stripped him. And he feels lonely and defeated and worthless. And then he takes it out on his wife and his family. And she feels shut out. She wants to be a part of his life and he just comes home. Usually if he's not where he should be with the Lord, he'll park himself in front of the television and sit there and just gaze in space. Or he'll say, leave me alone. And, and not just the married couples, but the singles are affected too. Periods of incredible, incredible loneliness. A spirit of gloom that they, they can't describe. They don't know where it's come from. A deep, dark sadness. An excruciating depression. It's a, it's a feeling like it, it's not even worth going on anymore. I got a letter from a 15-year-old girl in California. Single girl, of course. And she said, Brother Dave, please, you must help me. She'd had trouble with a boyfriend. Her boyfriend had broken her heart, went off with another girl, and left her brokenhearted. She thought her world had come to an end. She couldn't talk to her parents. She said, I read your book. I've got to talk. I think you could help me. I tried to call her because she said, if I don't get help, I'm going to kill myself. And her name was Kathy. And I tried to call and I couldn't reach her. And so I sent her special delivery and said, Kathy, do nothing till you call this number. Collect right away. I can help you. The letter came back unopened. And it must have been her parents who scribbled a note across the outside of the envelope that says, Please send no more mail. Kathy's no longer with us. She took her life. Now listen to me, friends. There are young people all over America on the verge of suicide. We've had all the calls here. We've had 15, 20 people raise their hands on the verge of suicide. It's because of this mental thing that comes in. This thing that sweeps in from nowhere when you least expect it. An absolute spirit of depression. Why is there so much mental anguish among Christians? Isn't the very thought of that a slap in the face of Jesus? Isn't there supposed to be supreme joy and peace in serving Christ? Why are so many Christians so full of this trouble of mind? All right, first of all, all mental problems, all mental anguish or depression is not spiritual in nature. It's not always spiritual in nature. For example, there's such a thing the doctors call as the sugar blues. Sugar. Now, I'm going to talk practical tonight. Don't blame God if you've just had a pint of Hagen doss and a half a dozen of Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> then you say, I'm so blue. I'm so depressed. Now, you may laugh at that, folks, but we have... Americans are eating so terribly now, there's a lot of sugar blues in America. You cut out some of that sugar and you watch some of that depression go. I'll tell you something. You, listen, a doctor would have charged you $35 and I gave it to you free. Sugar blues. I saw a secretary, not in my office, I saw a secretary who had a, box, a dozen boxes. When I went in there two hours later, that whole dozen donuts were gone. <laughs> By the end of the day, I pity her husband. She go home so blue, sugar blues. I mean it, folks. God never intended us to eat the way we eat. We like hogs. That sounds crude, but it's crude to what's happening in America. It's crude. God help us. Now, not only could it be sugar blues, but there's also chemical imbalances in the body. Now, I want you to listen very closely to me, please. God never intended Americans to live under the kind of stress that we're living under. There's, this is abnormal. Our society is not normal. Our society is abnormal now. There's nothing in America that's normal anymore. It's all abnormal. God never intended it to be this way. That we should be so worried over our jobs and our children, our future, our marriage. All, and I'll tell you what. My, my dearest, one of my dearest friends, Dr. Rice, a very godly Christian doctor, was with me in the service this morning. He had to fly back to Dallas. And he was sharing with me when I, when I was preparing this message. And... 
Uh, he's a very godly man. My wife's had five operations for cancer over the years, and he's been a godsend to, to, to in, in our life. He's, he's seen us through so much. And if he doesn't have a diagnosis, he just prays for the people. And he, he believes in healing a real man of God. And, and he explained to me what's happening. You see, God has so arranged this body that under tension or under stress, the body produces adrenaline. That gives you sudden surge of strength. I'll tell you what, if you saw your child... Uh, under a car, suddenly you can almost pick that car up. There's a uh, flow of adrenaline that comes into you. God put it there. But at the same time, there's another chemical that's secreted in the brain called serotonin. Serotonin is that which helps give a sense of balance. And when adrenaline, because of stress, is overproduced, serotonin is underproduced. It's not secreted as it should. And that, in turn, causes a depletion in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine. Now, listen closely. I'm not giving you a medical lesson. There's a truth here. I've proven it in my own home. Now, dopamine is that secretion in the brain that gives you a sense of well-being, a balance. It keeps you from being depressed. Now, the reason our, our kids that are on crack today are paranoid, permanently paranoid, is because crack, cocaine, destroys the dopamine in the brain. And it also destroys the possibility of it being repleted or produced. So they go into absolute depression and they can't pull out. Now this is what's happening. Now listen closely. Sometimes, especially women, I, I don't know what happens, but because of the stress in America, this constant producing of adrenaline in the brain because of stress with children, family, job, future, all of these things, there's a constant flow. And then the brain is not producing the serotonin, and then the dopamine is depleted, and then we have a chemically imbalanced individual, chemically imbalanced Christian. Now, I want you to listen, please. There was a time that we thought epilepsy was always demon-possessed. That was demon-possessed. I remember when I was when my father prayed for epileptics. We thought it was demon-possessed. Until they found out that you could put it on an EEG, and you could see the brain waves. And now there is a drug that absolutely controls epilepsy. If it were a demon, you couldn't control it. You couldn't control it. Now, my wife, is, I told you, had five operations for cancer. And in the process, her, we, we took her to asbestos because this was the greatest trial in our life. I didn't know that my wife had a chemical imbalance. I didn't know that those operations, an operation, if you've had one or more operations, this is often a, a, a problem of follow-up. I'm not a doctor, but I checked this out very, very carefully. So follow me, please. I, I promised that I'd be, I'd be faithful in this tonight. Because many of you women are worried that you have a spiritual problem. And it's not spiritual for a number of you. It's a chemical imbalance in your body. And I want you to listen closely because my dear wife, after five operations, she had a hysterectomy. Her body was not producing estrogen. And without estrogen in the body... There is an incredible, absolutely incredible kind of depression that sets in. And I, I got to the place where I came in one day and I said, Honey, I pray, I seek God, but I can't handle it anymore. And, and she said, David, I wouldn't blame you if you walked out on me. Now, I would never do that. But I was on my face night and day because I couldn't handle what was happening in my home. My wife loved me. She loved God. She loved the Word. But she didn't know what was happening to her body. She didn't know this terrible weariness that came over her. She didn't know this tiredness. She didn't know this terrible jealousy that would come over her. Things that, that would never bother before. Just overwhelmed. She'd cry herself to sleep at night. In fact, a lot of sleeplessness. Hardly able to sleep. And lifting her voice and speaking out and, and so many, many things that were so unlike her. And thank God for this Christian doctor who said, David, I don't think her problem's spiritual because I prayed for her. I, I went in one day and I thought that's demonic. I'll cast every demon out of her. I'll tell you what, if there was any spirits that had been cast out, it should have been me because I didn't have the patience. Didn't have the patience. But I couldn't understand. I'd be traveling all over America and come home to this, and it, I, I dreaded coming home. I dreaded walking in because I felt her pain. I, and you see, when a women are like this, they say, just leave me alone. Have you ever heard that, sir? 
Leave me alone. Let me work it out myself. And there's an isolation. And I used to say, Gwen, you have no right to shut me out, no matter how you feel. And I'm going to tell you that's true, sister. No matter how you feel, or brother, if you're married, or if you're in a home with family, no matter how low, no matter how depressed, no matter how bad you feel, you have no right to shut your mate or your family out. You have no right whatsoever to do that. That's ungodly, it's unchristian. He did some tests. He found out that she was absolutely depleted of estrogen. He took her into his office and gave her one and a half cc's of estrogen. Within two days, I had a new wife. I had an absolutely new wife. I saw joy. I saw victory. She said, honey, I've never felt like this in years. Now, my wife, I think it's been ten years now, and every week she has to have an estrogen shot. Because her body doesn't produce it. Her body doesn't produce it at all. Uh, two weeks ago, she went two extra days without her estrogen. And the same thing was happening again, the greatest depression. I hadn't seen it in almost a year. And I said, honey... What's happened? She said, oh, I forgot my estrogen shot. You say, well, well, why can't you just pray on the Lord healer? Well, listen, all it is, it's putting back in the body what's been depleted. God never, it, it's this system, it's this American system. It's the pressure that we're living under today. It's, it's the sin and corruption that's in the land. And all, all that my wife is doing now is putting back into her body what has been depleted. It's a natural, it's not a narcotic. And there are some of you, dear women... Now, I know there are some preachers who, who, who they, they'll hear this tape and they say, Brother David doesn't believe in divine healing. There's not a preacher on the face of this earth that believes in divine healing more than I do. We pray for the sick every night. I've seen God keep my wife alive. My wife should have been dead years ago. She's living on divine health. She's living in divine health right now. But she, there are some of you suffering great uh, depression. I would recommend you go to a good Christian brother, a good Christian man who can test and see if there is a chemical imbalance. Because I, listen, I can't tell you how many ministers and others I've sent to my doctor that were on the verge of divorce. Absolutely on the verge of divorce. Tried everything. Been to deliverance meetings. Deliverance meetings. Think it was demonic. And there would be a check of the blood. Be a pap smear. A few other tests. And suddenly... The deficiency was found, and within a week, the absolute healing of the marriage. Because the balance was found. We have imbalanced our bodies by the way we live and the stress that we're under. So, not all. And I'll tell you what, I can't tell you how relieved my wife was when she found out it was not demonic. Because she loved the Lord with all her heart. She was a precious child of God. If you know her, she, she just has a tender, beautiful heart. And, and she, she just hugged me one day and she said, oh, David, I thought I was losing my mind. I thought I was losing my mind. I thought I was going insane. She said, you don't know what I've been through. I said, well, I tried, honey. You couldn't talk. She said, well, honey, you can't talk about it. You don't know how to describe it. You can't express it. It's so deep. I didn't know how to tell you. How can you describe those feelings? And brother, I'll tell you what, there are some doctors that are absolutely unfeeling. They don't care because my wife would go and they'd say, uh, grow up is what they were trying to say. They, they, they were, you know, doctors are, are used to being conned. I know that. But, you know, a lot of doctors are just absolutely insensitive to what women are going through. They, they, they'll, they'll give you a test and they'll say, they won't even check it out the way it should be checked. You need to demand it if you go. But I want to tell you what, it's almost as if they, wait, she would go to the doctor and what... They made her feel like she was putting it on. Like she was faking it. Sister, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been to a doctor and they, they make you feel like you're just faking it? Or maybe your husband thinks you're faking it? Or others think you're faking it? Brother, sister, stand back. You don't have a slightest idea what she's going through. But God give you grace and strength. Now... Uh, that, what I've just told you is like telling overweight people that are obese that their problem is uh, uh, glands. When actually only one out of a hundred are gland problems. And so almost everybody that's overweight says, I've got a gland problem. 
No, it's a pork chop problem. It's not a plant <laughs> problem. Now, all right, now, let's, now we're going to get, going to get down to the nitty gritty. Now listen to me close now. Having said all that, let me say this. There is a depression that's demonic. Now listen closely, please. It's a result of stubbornness, disobedience, and self-will. And there are some of you hearing me tonight, and some of you hearing this tape, that are under the evil influence of an evil spirit of depression. And I'm going to show it to you in the Word of God. I want you to go to 1 Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel, please. We're going to show you the classical example of an evil spirit causing depression. It's the life of Saul. 1 Samuel. 16th chapter. 1 Samuel 16. I want you to go to verse 14. Are you still with me? If you are, say amen. amen. All right. Glory to God. We're going to get to the bottom of this thing tonight. Hallelujah. You see, some preachers would have the courage to stand and tell you what I told you just now. They think that robs you of your faith. It doesn't rob you of your faith at all. I can't stand up here and tell you anything but what I know to be the truth in my family and what I know to be the truth from the Word of God. Now listen closely here to 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. This was the depressing spirit, an evil depressing spirit. I right, look this way, please. There are great mental disorders that can be the result of the Holy Spirit leaving the body. When the Holy Spirit leaves a body, that's an invitation for evil spirits to move in. It's very clearly shown here. Do you know that God is still in control of everything that's ever been created? God is still, listen, He's still king of the flood. There's no demon that can make a move without his permission. They couldn't even enter the swine without permission from Jesus. Is that correct? There, there are so many instances in the Word of God that prove this. You know that uh, Job couldn't be harassed by the devil until the Lord took the wall down? Didn't, didn't the devil come to God and say, I can't get you, you've got a wall around him. And he removed the wall so that he could be tested. The devil can't touch you unless, the God, unless our God puts down the wall. Now, the Bible, it, it's not that God creates evil spirits. The evil spirits are there, but you can't get away. I've studied and looked at this verse from every angle, from the commentators and everything else. You can't get away that this evil spirit was sent by the Lord. God says, I'm moving out, and he commanded an evil spirit to depress him to move in. Because he controls all the forces of good and evil on the face of the earth. Nothing happens without his permission. It has to happen by his permission. But there's a reason for this permission. The reason is because Saul wanted his own way. He was a stubborn, self-willed man. He refused to take God's advice or advice from anybody. He had never got rid of a spirit of rebellion that was in him. He could blame somebody for every one of his problems. He always said, the people did it. They did it. I was afraid of the people. The people, everywhere you turn, you hear Saul saying, the people did it. They made me do it. You've heard the others say, the devil made me do it. He's saying, the people made me do it. Now, I want you to, let's look at life of Saul here and see how an evil spirit can possess a man and bring horrible depression and death. Look at Saul's life, if you will. 1 Samuel 10, 1. 1 Samuel 10, 1. This man is a type of a Christian, certainly because he was a man of God. And the Bible said these things happened unto them for examples to us upon whom the ends of the world have come. 1 Samuel 10, chapter, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him. This is Saul. And said, is, not, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now, do you agree with me that this man was anointed by God? If you do, say amen. amen. All right, look at verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy, and shall be turned into another man. Look at verse 10. 
And when they'd come thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. All right, look at me, please. Saul is anointed. He prophesies. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost. He's been turned into another man. And the Bible said also that he traveled with those that gathered around him, had a heart after God. He was in good company. See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen. Verse 24. There's none like him among all the people. There's none like him. I, he's, sur he's surrounded by godly people whose hearts God had touched, the scripture says. And for a while, Saul walks with God. For a while, he has great victories. Now, look at me, please. Look at me. Get this, please. He's a type of the modern Christian who goes along winning a number of victories, walking among Christian friends. At this point, there's no sign of mental deterioration. God seems to be blessing his hands upon him. There's no one like him in the land among the people. And he's winning victories. For example, remember when Jabez Gilead, or rather, uh, the Ammonites threatened Jabez Gilead. And the Bible says, they, they said, we're going to attack you. And if you don't, if you want to make peace with us, you've got to surrender to us and let us pluck out your right eye to make a reproach upon all of Israel. And so word was sent to Saul, said, we're surrounded by Ammonites. And they told us that if we're going to make a treaty with them, that the covenant with them would include the plucking out of our right eye so that we would be a reproach among all the people of Israel. And the Bible says, and the Spirit of God, when, he, when Saul heard that, the Spirit of God came on Saul when he heard those things. And his anger was kindled greatly. Oh, he had a zeal for God. No way are those heathen going to touch God's people. And he sent out a trumpet call around the land, and he gathered the armies of Israel. The Bible said Saul and his army slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered, and that not two of them were left together anymore. And Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Oh, they said, what a king we have. What a man of God we have. He was head and shoulders over all the people. At this time, he seems to be walking diligently before the Lord. But there comes a time in Israel's history when 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen of the Philistines come against Israel. And they're gathered, the children of Israel gathered at Gilgal. Samuel had told Saul, you wait there for seven days. Don't sacrifice till I get there. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care if the enemy starts marching on you. You wait for me. I'll sacrifice before God. And then we'll wait and get direction from God. And God will tell us what to do. And... He waited and waited. Seven days go by and Samuel didn't show up. And all the people of Israel were fleeing. His army was uh, scattered in all directions. And here come the chariots. He could hear them rumbling. And he couldn't wait any longer. He decided to do it his own way. Because he had a spirit in him of rebellion. A zeal for God, but it was based on the foundation of rebellion and stubbornness. God help you, sir, if you're a stubborn man. God help you, lady, if you're a stubborn woman. It's the spirit of witchcraft. It'll destroy you. It'll bring mental disorder. He couldn't wait. He said, bring me a lamb, spotless lamb. He slays the lamb, lays it out on the altar, and he takes on the role of a priest, which is the worst act of obedience this man could have ever done. First of all, he's panicked. He doesn't take God at his word. He doesn't take the prophets at his word. He has no respect for the pulpit. And there's something in him says, I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. Listen to me. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. We, we have a dear uh, psychologist that sits right down here in the front. Dear woman of God. But the reason she's successful and has such a good practice, she uses Jesus. She, she, she's not tied down by, by her trade. She, she uses the Word of God. She's a wonderful person. I'm not a psychologist. But I think God's beginning to show me the root cause, the root cause of most mental disorders in America and even in the church, the depression that's coming. It's this matter of doing things our own way, having a zeal for God, but say, I'll do what I have to do my way and my time. And so he sacrifices. And just as he's finishing his sacrifice, Samuel comes on the scene. Go to 1 Samuel 13th chapter. 13th chapter, 1 Samuel. Do you love the Word of God? 
First Samuel, the 13th chapter. And I want you to go to the 11th verse, please. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and you didn't come within the day appointed, the days appointed, the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal. I've not made my supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Listen, look at me. Have you, ever, have you ever met people that have an alibi for everything they do? I mean, they're stubborn. They're self-willed. They're always right. You know somebody that's always right? Never wrong. I mean, they, they can argue out of anything. They'll justify anything they do. And they're going to get in the last word, so help me. I know some husbands that ought to be lawyers. They're so good at it. Boy, I, I, I used to be good at that. Not anymore, thank God. He took that out of me. But I used to be good. My, my wife knew I'd always have to have the last word. And I always had to be right. Now I just want to be his and hers. First Samuel 13, verse 13 now. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now the kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. You know what a man after his own heart is? It's a man who obeys the word of God. It's a man who hears a message and says, God, I'll act on it. It's a man who gets alone with God in prayer and God tells him what to do or she's told what to do and she obeys God. She doesn't try to argue. He doesn't argue. Hear the word of God and obey. But now the king of God shall not continue. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be a captain of his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord hath commanded thee. Thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Listen, Saul became so headstrong, so determined to do God's work his own way, God said finally, it repents me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me. He does not carry out my word. He does not follow my commandments. I, and, and you don't, right, if, if you go, look at chapter 15, verse 13. Even though the prophet's talking to him, even God through the Holy Ghost is talking to him. Look at this man, he's always got to be right. Chapter 15, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He's a liar. He hadn't commanded, he hadn't done what God told him, but he's always right. Uh, Listen, I want you to go to 1 Samuel 28 now. I want to show you something about the end of this man. that, That mental deterioration, God's spirit departs from him. Remember what I told you? I read to you the verse, and the Spirit of God departed from Saul. And the Lord sent an evil angel, an evil spirit, to trouble him. Saul would be sitting on his throne, happy, and all of a sudden, bang, there it was. The Spirit would come upon him. And I'll tell you, when that Spirit comes, the first thing that does is troubles the house. All all of those in the house said, an evil spirit from the Lord has troubled you. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Call for David. He plays the harp. And so for a while, David would play the harp, and he would soothe him down. But I'll tell you what, demons don't run from hearts. You can come to this church, and you can listen to all the music. Demon's not going to run from the music. It can be as anointed as it can be. The devil's not going to run just from the music. No, if your heart has got a stubborn streak in it, if you're not going to obey God, if you refuse to obey the word of the Lord, you open yourself to this. Look, look at 1 Samuel 28, verse 15. We get to read verse 15. And Samuel said to Saul, by, oh, by the way, you know what Saul's doing here, don't you? He prayed. He's, he's about to go in battle against the Philistines again. And, and he's, he's prayed and God won't answer him. And he's gone to the priest. The priest gets no word. Heavens are shut to him now. God's not even talking to him. He doesn't hear anything from heaven. So what does he do? He goes to the witch at Endor. He's going to...
You, oh, I'll tell you, you'd be surprised when, when God shuts down what people go to. When the Spirit of the Lord departs, they'll turn to anything. They'll go to palm readers, tarot cards, anything. Because the Lord's not there anymore. Look at verse 28 now. Now, I'll tell you what, what's happened here. Now his mind is playing again because there's, there is no witch on the face of the earth can bring up a man of God from the grave. All right, this is an apparition. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I'm sore distressed. I'm depressed. I'm troubled. For the Philistines make war against me and God's departed from me. He answers me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I've called thee that thou must make known unto me what I should do. Then said Samuel, wherefore thou, wherefore then didst thou ask of me, seeing the Lord's departed from thee, is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord's taken his kingdom out of his hand and given it to his neighbor David. Because thou obeyed not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing upon thee. Verse 20, And Saul fell straightway along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. There was no strength in him for to eat no bread all the day nor all the night. Listen, look at me please. Saul died a madman. Saul died insane. He was insane when, they, when he was killed by the Philistines. Absolutely insane. A man of God who died in insanity. Why? Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord. I tell you now, if you don't hear anything else out of my message tonight, if, if, if God's told you to lay down a relationship, if He's told you to do something, and you know in your heart it's a clear word from the Lord, you'd better obey Him. Oh, the Bible said obedience is better than sacrifice. I know people that, they'll do anything for God but obey Him. I mean, they'll give the shirt, the, I know men that give the clothes right off their back. I know men that have such a zeal for God, they love people, they'll work with drug addicts, alcoholics, they'll, they'll go to people's homes, they'll clean the house, they'll do anything, they'll give their last dollar, but they won't lay down that thing God told them to lay down. They'll hold on to that thing tenaciously. I tell you now, mental health, good mental health, depends on obeying the Holy Ghost. Obey Him. If He says, do it, do it. And I'll tell you what, God will open up your mind and there'll be a, a spirit of divine health flow into you. Hallelujah. Saul, you know, David saw what happened to Saul. And then when David sinned, you know the first thing David did? He ran to the altar of repentance and said, oh God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? He said, I don't want to go mad like Saul went. I don't want to lose my mind. I saw what happened when the Spirit of God departs. I'm going to ask you a question. Remember this scripture that I read to you? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just go over once more. Listen to this. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The next verse says, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. See, the Spirit's coming and it's going. The Spirit's coming on David and it's leaving Saul. My question to you, in your life, is the Spirit coming or going? Is it coming or going? See, with David, the Spirit of God stayed with him the rest of his life. He grew from grace to grace and glory to glory. This man had, oh, what a spiritual mind, what a giant he became mentally. Good mental health. Even when his soul was cast down, he knew where to go. Saul, so, I'm asking you, is the Spirit coming or going? If the Spirit of God, if there's disobedience, if there's rebellion, if there's stubbornness in you, the Spirit of the Lord may one day depart. But if your heart is open to Him, so God, give me an obedient spirit. Give me an obedient heart. The Spirit of the Lord is always coming on, coming on. Hallelujah. Coming, baptizing, healing. Hallelujah. How, how many before a holy God tonight can say, I believe the Spirit's coming upon me. I believe He's coming in my life because I want to obey the Lord. I don't want disobedience in my life. All right, I'm going to close very soon, but I want to give you what I believe is the key. Uh, uh, I'm going to want you to go to one more verse, Revelation, the third chapter. And here's the, here's the key. Here's the heart of it. Here's the key to mental health, good mental health. One verse, Revelation 3.20. And I'll tell you, mark it down and quote it every day of your life. And I ask God right now in the next five minutes to open it up. I'm going to preach five minutes, then I'm finished. But I want you to hear it. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I'll sup with him and he with me. All right, you have it? 
I, now, I, please forgive me for saying it once more, but look this way. I, I like to look you right in the eyeball. I'm going to tell you something. This scripture is often used in the context of Jesus standing at the door of the heart of the sinner and wanting to come in and bring grace and salvation. That's a part of it. But there's another part, and I believe it's even more significant. It's, it's something the Holy Spirit showed me this past week. And it has to do with our mental health. Church of Jesus Christ here at Times Square, listen to me, please. I believe that this one he's talking to here, Jesus is already in because he's talking to his church. He's already in the heart. He already abides. He's there. He's inside the heart. But you see, he, he, he is abiding with this Christian sister, this Christian brother. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a flood. The enemy comes in like a flood. And there's a sudden swamping, a spirit of depression, or blues, whatever you want to call it. It just sweeps in from absolutely nowhere. Some of you know what it's like. Folks, I've only had one experience. It only lasted two weeks. I only had two weeks of depression probably in my lifetime. But it was horrible. And some of you endured it for weeks. Some of you go through stages. It keeps coming back on you. You'll go a week or two or a month or even three months. And then suddenly, for no reason, there it is. That flood is there. You can't understand what's happened to you. And when it comes, you, you feel unworthy. And what usually happens when that comes, there's a tendency to find a little secret room in your heart to escape. And you go into that little room and you hide. Now, you may occasionally call a friend that you trust, but you've already found out your friend can't pull you out. So eventually, not even your friend. You go to counselors and they're finally shut out. The pastor's shut out because... You still find that it comes in on you, and there you are. Now, it's not a physical room I'm talking about. It's a spiritual thing. There's a little secret isolation place where you go to brood, and to think, and to stare into space, and try to figure it all out. And it's a little room of memories. Memories. Thinking about childhood, something that happened to you way back. And you go into this little room. See, it's not that Jesus left you. You walked away from Him. You went into your little room. You went into this little closet. You shut the door and you hung up a little tag outside. And says, leave me alone. I'm unworthy. Leave me alone. I'm hurting. And when it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I believe he's talking about that little room where you go. That isolation you bring yourself to. That cutting away from everybody else. And I know I'm talking in the spirit right now. Some of you have done that for years. You go right there. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can get near you. It's not that you don't love the Lord, but you're going to try to ride this out. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus, loving us as He does, sees you get up and escape into your little room, your little hiding place, your little brooding room, your thinking room. And He says... I can't let you do this. I care too much about you. And I see Jesus go to that room of yours. And he knocks. And he says, Hear me. Open up. And there it is, brother, sister. If you go to the psychiatrist, you'll lay down on the, on the bed or a couch and say, Open up. Tell me what's on your heart. Isn't it amazing that Christians don't know how to open up to their master? What the Lord is saying, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leave you. I'm not gonna budge. I'm gonna tell you something. When you go into that little room and you're a Christian, you're a child of Jesus, He's not gonna move. He's not gonna budge. He's gonna stand right there and He's gonna keep knocking. Not yelling. He won't force His way in there. Because if He has to force His way in there, you won't hear a word He says. But He's gonna keep knocking on that door. And He's saying, I know your pain. All the power of the Godhead is invested in me. I'm your shepherd. Open the door. Let me put light into that room. Let me come in. I've got my arms full of good things and we're going to dine. I want to sup with you and you with me. We're going to have a dinner table talk. I'm going to talk this over with you because I've got an answer for you. If you'll talk this out with me and not with people, we're going to settle this thing. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice... If you'll sit here right now and say, Jesus, 
And you know what that voice is calling? He's calling you by name. You know what he's saying? I don't care how long you stayed there. I don't care how long you locked up in there. I'm not leaving. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Oh, how patient our Jesus is. He'll just stand right there and knock. And I want to tell you something. Some of you that have gone through such depression and you feel backslidden, you feel like you're, you, you, you've got, the, the, the devil's injected such evil thoughts in you. Listen, I, just this afternoon I was reading the story of, of, of a pastor, uh, uh, Mather, uh, one of the early Puritans, Cotton Mather's nephew, I believe it was. He's writing about the death of his own nephew, a very godly man. And they quoted from his diary. And he's one of the godliest men that ever lived in America. A preacher of the gospel. And just before he died, he said, For years I've been hassled and harassed with blasphemous thoughts. The devil has tried to attack me more than any man on the face of the earth with evil thoughts. He said, That's what's drawn me close to the Lord because I have made it a rule of my life to take it to Jesus. And I've grown strong in it. I know what it is to sit in a pulpit in front of 10,000 people and have the devil come and throw blasphemy thoughts at me. Thoughts like, curse God. There is no God. You're wasting your time. And I hear these vile curses coming from out there somewhere. The devil trying to inject them into my mind. And I want to tell you, the devil will do that. He'll try to inject those evil thoughts into your mind. That you're unsaved, you're ungodly, you're helpless, that you're going to commit suicide. He'll throw everything he's got in hell at your mind. But when that comes, you stand up in the name of Jesus and say, Those are not my thoughts. Those are the devil's thoughts. I bind them in Jesus' name. Some of the godliest people I know have had to battle thoughts, evil thoughts that the devil tried to bring on them. That doesn't mean that you're not right with God. Often it means that you're making progress and the devil sees it. I'm telling you tonight that you don't need to call a counselor. I'm telling you tonight that even if it were demonic, you have deliverance in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can set you free. What have you got locked up in that room? I know my friend John down in Texas. His name was John. He was a scientist, a brilliant man. And I I know... I could see it come on him. He'd go along for about three months, and all of a sudden, that spirit would hit him. And he'd go into that little block room. You could, all the scripture verses, everything you say, he didn't hear a word. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody could touch him. His wife, nobody could touch him. I tried for days and days, and finally I couldn't reach him. I'll tell you what was locked in his room. It was his father. Memories of his father. His father was an army colonel, a career man that was a perfectionist. And this boy could never please his dad, and he himself became a perfectionist. Everything had to be just right. He was trying, somehow, you know, his dad was dead. He was still trying to please his dad. His dad had been dead for ten years, and this man still trying. He said, David, I could never please my father. And he'd go into that room and replay his whole life with his father. One day, John went into the bedroom he was visiting in Houston, went in the bedroom, he took out a large insurance policy, made sure that suicide was covered in the policy, took a shotgun to his stomach and pulled the trigger and killed himself. He couldn't shake that depression. He couldn't shake it off because that room locked in there was a memory. You take that locked memory, you take everything there is in that room, and you bring it out, Jesus says, open up to me. Open the door. The door to that locked room. The door to that thing that's held you. That despair. That father, that mother, that thing in your childhood. I don't care if it's incest. I don't care if your father beat you. I don't care what it was. Open it up. Open the door. Bring it to Jesus. He said, I'm the one that has the answer. You don't need to tell it to somebody else. Tell it to me. And the tragedy is, folks, the tragedy is we've, we don't even know how to talk to Jesus anymore about what's going on. I've learned to be honest with Jesus. I go home there anymore and I lay down before God. I tell him everything. David said, I poured my heart out. My soul was cast down, so I went to God and I poured out my soul. Tell him everything. Tell him about your lust. If you're married and you've been trying to get out of your wedding, out of your marriage and your vows, tell him. Lord, 
I don't love my wife anymore, I don't think. I think I'm in trouble, Lord. I'm not treating her like I should. I've got a lust. There's another. Name the woman. Name everything. Tell it all. Get it all out. If you'll go to Jesus, if you'll open up, say, Lord, I'm going to open up every dark room in my house. Every window, every door. I'll take you down the basement and show you the old skeletons. I'm going to take you up in the attic and show you all those low loves in my life. I'll take it all, Lord. Open it up and let the Holy Ghost come in and just sweep out the house. If my Bible says he will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Stayed on the Lord. Stand, please. Now, I know tonight some of you are going through a literal hell. <laughs> Why, well, some of you, it, it, it really hurts as a pastor that you just sometimes you feel you don't have the answers and you, you want so bad you pray for people and they go through so much hurt. I don't think there's a pastor that hasn't cried over many of you. I know I have. I've wept over some of you. We hurt for you. But the truth is, there comes a point we can't go any deeper with you. We just have to turn you over to Jesus. And I can promise you that He's standing right at the door of your heart. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care how you're hurting tonight. If you just open up and say, Jesus, come. And you make up your mind this next week in the next 30 days. You start having these table talks with Jesus. Wine and dine with Him. Sit down and talk to Him. Don't sit in front of television. That just makes you sadder. That, I, I tell you, you're going to be depressed watch television. You're going to just blow everything. Turn off that idiot box and just get alone with Jesus. Shut the door and say, Jesus, I'm not leaving here until I have your joy in my heart. And I'll tell you what, just start thinking of what it's going to be like in eternity. Think about all the good things God's already done. Start counting your blessings. Start being honest with Him. And you watch how the Holy Spirit Himself comes in. Begins to take control. Hallelujah. That's when the devil has to run. Now let me tell you how I believe you can tell if it's demonic. You can tell if it's demonic. Listen closely now. If you have in you a spirit of rebellion and stubbornness about a particular sin that you won't let go. You've been dealt with it time and time again. And you've sat through the Word of God for weeks and weeks. And if it's still holding on, chances are very high that that's a demonic stronghold needs to be broken. We're going to believe God tonight to break even satanic strongholds and set you free. Hallelujah. Do you believe God's able tonight? I said, do you believe God's able tonight? Yes, he is. I'll tell you something else. I believe also that God heals chemical imbalances. I believe he can heal you. I believe he can heal appetites. I got two amens out of this whole congregation. I believe he can heal appetites. Yes, he can. Beloved, the Lord's doing something by His Word right now. By your heads. And while I'm praying, if this message was meant for you, hear me now, up in the balcony, hear the main floor. If this message was meant for you, and the Spirit of the Lord's tugging at your heart, you said, Brother Wilkinson, I've got to have freedom. I want you to get out of your seat and come and stand here while I'm praying. Up in the balcony, just go to the exit and down. Please don't come unless the Spirit draws you. But the moment you feel that tug or pull, that's the Holy Spirit saying, Tonight, open up. I don't want you to come unless you're willing to open up everything to Him. You're going to make a commitment that you're going to open up your heart to Him. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, find everybody in this building tonight that needs deliverance. Some, Lord, have a demonic stronghold. Others, Lord, are, are suffering from a medical problem, a chemical problem. Others, Lord, just a spirit of stubbornness that needs to be dealt with. Others, Lord, who have not learned how to open up to you. 
You're the one, Lord Jesus, who can help us open up. Well, they're singing. Come on, join these that are here. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God for miracles tonight here tonight. We're going to believe God for real miracles. Please move in tight. Move in close and tight so we can make room for these coming in. Move in closer here. All of you for just a moment. I want you to believe. And in fact, I'm going to ask, do you really believe that the Lord is standing at the door of your heart knocking right now saying, open up, hear my voice. I know you by name. I know everything you're going through. And I've got the solution. I've got the power. How many believe the Lord's knocking at the door? That door, that secret door of your little room. You going to open up that room to him right now? <laughs> Son, is it true that there is a room in your... Do you have one of those rooms in your heart? Yes. Uh, you can, a tendency to shut people out? Yes. Isolate. Isolate. Do you have that kind of a place where you go? Nobody, just leave me alone. Trying to suffer through by yourself. Do you know what that room's like? Open it up tonight. Do you have that room? Is that... Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? You said that just before you came to church. You, were, you wanted everybody to leave you alone. Just be alone. It's the worst thing you can do. The only one to be alone with is Jesus. That's all right. Never been able to surrender in 20 years. You've been holding on to something for years. You ready to let go of it right now? Amen. I do. Amen. Just hold. Lord, say it right now. Jesus, Jesus I give it up. I, give I lay it up down. I lay it I'm going to obey you now. And I will obey you. I, I want everybody that has to, I don't want to know what it is, but everyone that has to lay something down, raise your right hand so we can pray about it right now. Raise your right hand. All right. Will you go into that room now and dig it out right now? Let's, let's bring it right out to the light. Don't, nobody has to know, but you and Jesus. Say it right now. Jesus, Jesus. I want it out. This thing hidden in me, I bring it to the light, expose it, forgive me. I give it to you, Jesus. Give me power and a willingness to obey you now. I obey the Lord Jesus. Come in, Jesus. Come into my room. Come into this secret place. Fill me now and heal my mind and my spirit. Now, thank him right now. Jesus, take it right now. Take it now. Take it all, Lord Jesus. We bind the enemy. We bind the enemy in Jesus' name. We bind it. All right, now. Listen closely, please. There are some of you here tonight that may have a demonic stronghold. And we have saints of God here tonight to believe God answers prayer. People, I want you to join me tonight. We're not even going to have to lay hands on these tonight. You that listen to me, all be in the aisle right here. If, you, if you've had this thing that you can't let go and you believe there's been a satanic stronghold in your heart, I want you, you don't even have to raise your hand. You just stand right now at attention before a holy God. We're going to have this congregation and the pastors behind me and we're going to pray right now in Jesus' name. We're going to take authority over that. And I tell you, there's such power of God here tonight. Those spirits cannot remain. They will depart and the spirit of the Lord will come in. And I'm going to ask you, after I'm done praying, to raise your hands and say, Holy Spirit, fill me anew. Fill me fresh. Fill me full of the Holy Ghost tonight. Just fill me. And I'll tell you, if you open up and lift your hands to the Lord, He'll do just that. We're going to believe. Saints, all over the building, will you join me in prayer as we take authority now over every demonic stronghold? Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, I'll pray. You just listen. We bind every evil spirit. We bind every evil spirit that's come because there's a heart for obedience now. There's a heart to open up to you and we're opening our hearts. We command in Jesus name every evil spirit to release everybody that's at this altar tonight. Release. Every evil spirit must depart. You're commanded in Jesus name to depart this body. Depart. Command it right now in Jesus name. So I command Satan in Jesus name. I command every evil spirit to depart. I command it to depart in Jesus' name. Command it in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, to be free. In the name of Jesus tonight. Binding every spirit of evil. Drive it out, Lord. Drive out every evil spirit. Drive out every evil spirit. 
she's all right. Just lay hands on her. She's all right. Just let her worship. That's the Holy Spirit. She, she's being released. Thank you, Jesus. Just worship him now, dear. Just worship him now. Hallelujah. Now raise your hands and say, fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, by your spirit, come down now and fill us. Fill our hearts, Lord, with your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Fill me now. Blessed Jesus, fill me now. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Open up your heart to him right now where you stand. Lord, I open to you to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. To be filled right now, Lord, to overcoming, overflowing, overflowing. Let's worship the Lord. Let's just worship Him right now. Lord, we worship. We praise You. We give You glory. Lift the burden, Lord. Lift the burden. Set the minds free. Set our minds free. Lord, there's freedom in the name of Jesus from this moment on. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Never to be afraid again. Never to be afraid again. Lord, never to be afraid again. Never to be afraid. Father, never to be afraid. Jesus, never to be afraid of the enemy. I will fear no evil. Say it. I will fear no... Again, I will fear no evil. Once more, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. I want to know how many of you that are up here at this altar for the first time in this church. Raise your hand. You've never been up here before. All right, you that have come up for the first time. I'd like you to meet us backstage so we can minister to you one by one. You're up here for the first time. All right. Hold, hold still. You're here for the first time. Come up this way. Right through the crowd. Make your way through the crowd. All right, dear. You can come back. Uh, all right. Those that are here for the first time, yet, you come up those steps on this side also. Come up these steps. Those that are in the aisle, we'd like to minister to you backstage. We've got counselors. God bless you. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Get rid of all my sins. Get rid of all your sins, yes. How about you, son? Forgive you for everything. You want God to touch you tonight? God bless you. How about you? Cleanse and... This is the conclusion of the tape.